Good evening, everybody. Um, delighted to be here. Um, here we have uh, Andre Asiman, author of Find Me, and Call Me By Your Name, and several other books, short stories, and a memoir. And Howard Rosenman, one of um, possibly the most prolific, extremely prolific Hollywood producer, um, father of the bride. Um, yeah, I've got my father here, so it's like really <laughs> special. Um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Call Me By Your Name, which was your first collaboration together. Um, it's won, I've, uh, I've written it down, over 200 awards, 236 nominations, award nominations, 94 wins, which is astounding. Um, and it's a testament to, to your, your eye for a fantastic story, a fantastic tone, and, the, and Andre, as creator of this story and the beautiful characters um, that you've made. Um, so congratulations on that. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here in conversation. Um, thank you, Rachel, for the lovely introduction. Um, it's really important um, here at JWP that we can welcome voices from around the world to speak about the Jewish experience, the diversity of Jewish life. And just to kick off the conversation, which will be about an hour, and then we'll have half an hour for, for questions, I think, um, from the floor. Um, but start at the beginning. Your backgrounds, you've got um, quite different backgrounds. Andre, you grew up in Alexandria, in Egypt, and you are um, a New Yorker, but generations going back, you're Israeli, um, or your ancestors were Israeli. And I'd like to ask you both, what is it that you've taken from your backgrounds that's carried with you in life, specifically um, of, of Jewish nature or otherwise, um, this idea of fitting in, not fitting in? Um, and how, how, is the, uh, how have the ideas of things that you've taken from your background carried with you through your life and work? Um, should we start? You want me to start? Sure, yeah, okay. sure, why not? Considering the fact that you're talking from a totally lapsed Jew, uh, so that um, I've never been bar mitzvahed. I refused to. My father asked me if I wanted to have a bar mitzvah, you know, sort of a perfunctorily asked. And I said, no, he said, fine. And that was the end of that. And uh, so we took care of that. I don't like rituals of any kind. And, and so I, I would, uh, during Passover, at a Seder, because my, some, there were parts of my family that were very religious, it was always myself, uh, looking at my mother, who was completely deaf, looking at her, and of course we would start to giggle as the thing was going on, because she couldn't hear a thing, and I didn't understand a word of what was being said. And, and so th that was my induction into Judaism. In other words, with a great deal of reluctance. Um, but um, there are many things that, I mean, basically I think that every Jew, one, whether he's a believer or not, is, Ultimately, there's one thing you have to do as a Jew is you have to pay a price for being Jewish. It is not possible to be a Jew and not hope that you weren't Jewish. I think the prophets were the first ones to do that, to not want to be speaking to God, talk to someone else. Um, this kind of not wanting to deal with this whole heritage. Um, I paid a price for being Jewish. I think most people do. Um, I was born in Egypt, and it was rabidly anti-Semitic. I, I felt anti-Semitism every single day at school. It, it was, there was not a day when you didn't feel it, and it's a horrible feeling. You hide it. You hide being Jewish. Of course, that's the first thing you learn. Then you find out that it's really not possible to hide it because people know. They find <coughs> out, and the voice is rabid and goes around. And eventually, you find yourself, as I did, you know, why was I not born Catholic? Which is a weird thing to say, because of course I didn't want to be a Catholic. I, I sort of liked being who I was. But the, the, the price is huge, and there's always an invoice that comes. And the, the, the invoice that I received was I was being expelled from the life that I had grown up thinking was going to be the rest of my life, being in Egypt, being sort of in a comfortable situation. And you feel that that feeling of being in a hostile environment has stayed with you, even though you live in New York now? Well, that's the, I live in New York, which should be, so no, I, I actually, um, it's strange because I was once in, in a, it was snowing one day, and I was in, a co in the college, the first day of college it was snowing, um, and um, somebody said something about the snow, and we started speaking, and he said he was Jewish, and basically for him, saying that he was Jewish was like 
let's go and get a beer or something. It was, uh, I realized, uh, because we were speaking so easily about being Jews, uh, that it's okay to be Jewish. It's natural to be Jewish in New York. Uh, it's, 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 it, they shouldn't even be, you shouldn't even think twice about saying to someone that you're Jewish. And that has changed in my life in the sense that here I am admitting that I'm Jewish uh, and yet it's, it's, it's easy, it's no, no problem. Uh, but in Egypt it was, it was very difficult and it was a horrible thing. And do you feel the same way about New York? <coughs> no, or? I feel the exact opposite um, from Andre. I was brought up very, very differently. My parents were both born in Jerusalem, uh, in Me'a Sharim, the most religious community in Jerusalem, and they're both seven generations born in Jerusalem. So I have very, very deep roots in Israel, although I was born in Brooklyn and raised on Long Island. We moved to Long Island when I was six. And I never had a problem with being Jewish. It was just part of the <coughs> natural thing. In fact, I uh, spent so many years in Israel because my father could never make up his mind where he wanted to live. So we lived two years in Israel and three years in America and four years in Israel, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I was, I was always on the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth going back. But I had this kind of heritage that was Israeli. And I was proud of being Jewish, very. In fact, I, uh, in 1967, I volunteered for the Six Day War, although I wasn't an Israeli citizen at the time, and my parents were. I volunteered for the Six Day War because I was in medical school. And I went to Israel, and I, had a ve and I was brought up modern Orthodox. My parents were both brought up ultra-Orthodox, Haredim, if you know what the difference is. And, uh, but when, they, when my parents came to America in the 20s, the first thing they did with my father was cut his payas off, and he was brought up essentially modern Orthodox. We were brought up in the height of the flower of the full bloom of modern Orthodoxy in uh, uh, Long Island with Rabbi Rachman. We were part of a shul that was rich and very Zionist and very pro-Israel. And, and so when I volunteered for the Six Day War, I was religious up until that time. But I had a paradoxical reaction to the conquering of Jerusalem. Because when I was a little kid, my grandparents lived in Abu Tor, which is on the border of the no man's land. And I could look across the way and see the old city. My father would tell me stories about the old city. And we were supposed to be able to go to the old city, to the, to the Western Wall and to the uh, cemetery in Harazetim and the Mount of Olives. But the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan didn't allow us to do that. So I would, used to look across the way as a kid from 1948 to 1967, thinking I'll never get to be there. Well, suddenly I was there. In fact, I was there when Rabbi Shlomo Gorin, who was the chief Ashkenazi rabbi, blew the shofar, the ram's horn, on Har Habayit, on the uh, Temple Mount. And I had a, this paradoxical reaction. I decided I don't have to be religious because I had the privilege of being in Jerusalem. And I wrapped myself up in the Israeli flag. And that's my religion today. Although I have a sister that's ultra-Orthodox in Jerusalem, who I'm going to see and who I'm close to tomorrow, uh, Friday, and I have a brother who's modern Orthodox. And so the three of us were brought up in the same family. I have a sister who's off the charts religious, right wing. Me, I'm all the way on the left, and my brother's in the middle. So both of you don't feel that you are practicing in the in the rituals at the moment. So what do you feel is the nub of being Jewish? Do you think this is something that you share? The, yeah. Well, no. You, you well, it, is then, it, maybe it's a very personal thing. The moral ethos of tikkun olam, basically, and the wrestling with God. Jacob wrestled with God. Yisrael means wrestling with God. And um, every Jew I think, wrestles with God. And it's allowed. Although, in the right wing of Judaism and the left wing of Judaism, they're both fascistic in their own way. And so, me, you know, it's like, I'm a Jew. I'm a gay Jew Hollywood <laughs> producer. That's how I define myself. You know, and fuck them if they don't like it. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse my language. <laughs>
Andre, you feel the same? Uh, um, we see, of, of it's it's Jewish. complicated because I am Jewish, and I've always been Jewish. And it's not just that I was born into a Jewish family. Um, most of my loyalties are towards Jews. Um, I give preferential treatment to Jews. I'm the kind of bad Jew who gives <laughs> any Jew, basically, I'll, I'll, I'll listen You're to You're being him. honest about it. Though. Yeah. No, I mean, it's preferential treatment. There's no question. Um, I, will, if, I mean, if a Jew stops me in the street and tells me I'm Jewish, I'll, I'll, I'll listen. I'll, I'll do whatever. Unless they want to convert me, then I don't <laughs> want to talk to them. Uh, but I think that the kind of Jew I am is, I'm a Jew, I'm sort of a cliche of the Jew who doesn't believe in religion, but is very pro-Jewish and very pro-Israel. Sorry, there's a What? There's you have a glass, glass right glass. under your seat. Oh, okay. I see. Got it. Um, so that in, in many ways, the kind of values that I share with Judaism are the, the prototypical ones, the typical ones, the, the Jewish irony, Jewish humor, Jewish love for parents, uh, Jewish, um, the, the, the way you, you sort of, you revere authority if it comes as authority. Uh, I've got every single one of those things, generosity. Um, I'll do anything that is typically Jewish. At the same time, um, of course, I, I have this feeling that a, a, a Jew, who, I, I said it before, a Jew who doesn't wrestle with God is, is really lacking something. A Jew who doesn't assume that God is, as I always like to say, God has a sense of irony that's amazing. I mean, he picked Jews, okay? Not according to Jeremy <laughs> Corbyn. <laughs> um, it's interesting that you, you feel that there are very shared qualities, but you grew up as a Sephardi family. You presumably... Ashkenazi. I can't I mean, be more it's, Ashkenazi. It's Ashkenazi, <laughs> even though seven generations Israeli. But these idea that we just somehow share things. Um, yes. In Out of Egypt, you, you, you um, talk about the internal snobbery about um, certain kinds of Jews against yes. other kinds of Jews, which obviously is also happens in the Ashkenazi community as well. Um, so how do you think that that's translated within Jewish culture if you're sort of comparing Jews from Syria with, with Jews from Poland? And, and it's this, how do you think... And do you recognize it in each other and other Jews? How does this get translated through culture? I don't know because there's not much culture that is Jewish, but it is received culture. So the kind of things that nobody tells you that you don't learn. It's, it's sort of a sense of, of it's, it's this sense that you pick up that this is the way to be. And it's, you have to sort of, you don't trust in luck for one thing. In other words, if you're very lucky, you assume that something is going to happen to take it away from you. Uh, that's automatically Jewish. I, I, okay. But you know, people who are you know, Zoroastrians will tell you the same thing. Oh, we're the same. Okay, but you're not, you don't have it the way we Jews have it. Uh, there's, a, there's a sense that Judaism is, as I say in, in my book, Out of Egypt, and it's, I think every Jew understands this sentence. Um, it is in the history of Judaism that every person will lose everything they own at least twice. Not just once, but at least twice. In other words, yeah. if you lose everything you've owned twice in your life, you, you, you basically are prepared for that. It's the fourth time that it becomes... It relaxes a bit after the second See, yes. I don't have that feeling at all because my parents were revisionists. Do you all know what a revisionist is? Uh, Zev Jabotinsky, uh, who was a theater critic, um, wrote a, a thesis, essentially, revising the image of the Jew. In other words, the Jew was no longer the pale, hook-nosed moneylender of the ghetto. He was a soldier. He was a farmer. He was a nobleman. He was a, 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 a fantastic persona. And he revised the image of the Jew. The labor government, later, in, when, when, when Ben-Gurion came to power, stole that concept and made it into the Sabra. I have that, that Sabra feeling. Well, <laughs> nothing's going to happen to me. I'm going to kill him, you know. <laughs> and that's the way it is, you know. Uh, you know this, do you know the story about the two Jews walking in the ghetto? And um, they're, they're, they're followed by a German guy. And uh, they begin to get very nervous. Uh, correct me if I'm getting it wrong. But one of this is, is somebody following us, and uh, maybe we should get 
And uh, th they say, yes, you're right. Nobody of the two s says, there's two of us and there's only one of him. In other words, their assumption is that you're always in danger. And I come from that tradition, not from yours. I envy yours. Not only that, but even in the Talmud, there's a phrase, there's a saying, does anybody speak Hebrew here? Habala hargacha hashkem lahargo. If someone is coming to kill you, get up early in the morning and kill him first. <laughs> in fact, there's a book that Ron Lesham wrote about all the Mossad assassinations called Rise Up and Kill. And that's my persona. Not only that, because I was gay and I was bullied as a kid, I learned how to deal with a bully. And in order to deal with a bully is you have, you have to out-bully them. And when I was 13, I learned that lesson well, and I started taking essentially Krav Maga lessons. So people who would bully me, I would take their arm. I think fold they it, still offer Krav Maga at JW3, yeah. right? <laughs> fold, fold their arms to the back of their head, and I would say, I'm going to beat the crap out of you. And everybody was afraid of me after that. And I decided, OK, that's what I'm going to be. And that's how I became a Hollywood producer. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you read Andre's book, Call Me By Your Name. And there were so many, I suppose, themes in that book that, that might have attracted you to it and thought, OK, this is going to be a film. You're going to option it. Do you want to tell us the story of what, what you recognized? Was it a Jewish theme, or was that just one amongst so, many? So I have a friend named Gil Shiva, who was born in Rehobot, oh, yes, who's Gil. now 80. He was called the handsomest man in Israel. And I met him in 1967, and we became very, very close friends. Essentially, he's my mentor. He's 10 years older than me. Actually, he's 84. And he married the richest Jewish girl in the world, Jules Stein's daughter, who founded MCA Universal. Married her, moved to the Dakota, had two children. Well, one day he calls me up. I was actually acting in Milk at the time, which is another story. And I get a call from Gil on the set. And he says, Howard, you've got to read this book. Because Andre Asiman, who was a friend of Gil Shiva, gave the manuscript to Gil. And Andre said, I think this is correct, get this script to Howard Roseman. It has his name written all over it, Gay Jew. <laughs> 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 so I read it. And I said, ah, has my name written all over it. <laughs> and the next day, we started the process of getting the book. And it's. That's what it's about. You know, it's different than my upbringing because Andre's book is about gay people coming out and Jews coming out, essentially. It's a double whammy. And so I was attracted to, to both those things. Even though I never had a trouble coming out as a Jew, I did have trouble only at the very beginning coming out as gay because I was gay, gayer than paint. You know, um, when I was 21 years old, and I didn't give a fig. <laughs> We're talking about fruit now, I think. <laughs> Those of you who've read the book or um, watched the film, we'll get, um, so there were um, there are very subtle elements of, of Jewish themes <clears throat> in in the film in the book, and also with the casting as well. How important was it to you both? to have the Jewish elements very much there, but sort of understated. Not, it didn't, it's not really a Jewish film in, in terms of plot or even character. It doesn't affect their character in any way. So, and, and was it different for the book and the film? How did that process work? No, I, th I thought that the film was a, a very delicately, and the whole film is very delicate, very sort of um, toned down in many things. But one of the subjects was that the both boys are are Jewish, and one is riding the bicycle with his Star of David showing, and the other one says, you know, we are, as he uses the phrase, we're Jews of discretion, which is exactly how Italian Jews are. They will never tell you they're Jewish. You will find out after many, many little signals that they sort of launch at you that, oh, well, if you don't open the shop on Saturday, then, I mean, I have a shirt maker in Rome, and I went to, to have a shirt and shirts made. And um, I said, you know, I passed by the store, but it was closed yesterday. Yes, we were closed yesterday, but it was Saturday. So, and, but they were open on Sunday. So I, I sort of immediately understood, but they were giving me little hints, little hints. And then finally she said, well, you know, when 
when I said I was born in Egypt, but I was kicked out of Egypt because I was Jewish, because I was okay telling them I was Jewish. And they said, well, you see this little thing that we wear, most people think it's a dog, but it's really a Shaddai. Okay, so it took them forever to tell me that they were Jewish because they're not comfortable with it. And that's, I think, the rest of the world is that way. Not, Jew not in Israel. What? You know, it's I'm, a I'm Jewish like, country. So I'm, I'm Jewish. I'm going to kill you. I'm wearing, I'm having a rifle. You know, it's <laughs> like, don't mess with me. It's a different ethos, actually. I, I, I totally, I approve of it, but just don't kill me, okay? No, no. <laughs> um, and there's a moment in the movie that's actually a plot point in the movie when, when the mother touches the Jewish star of Timothy Chalamet of Elio, and it's very gentle and very delicate, and she's telling him, I know that I've been discreet about my Judaism. I'm happy that you're accepting it, and I'm also telling you that I know that you're having an affair with. She's not telling him that. Well, she's not telling him that. But she she realizes that, that he's only. She realizes that he's only got it out because. But she so is telling him about the Jew thing. Yeah. The Jew thing she's okay with, but she doesn't know, and it's important for her not to know. So that when he says, "Does mom know?" Yeah. It, it, it's it's not something we're discussing. The book was very very. Uh, no, I mean, the, the, I think the th <laughs> forget it. <laughs> but you know, in the in the um, uh, that that question, does mom know? Yes. I get hundreds of questions. Was she asking about me, or was she asking about my father? My father. And so, basically, when I wrote the book, it was, does mom know I'm sleeping with Oliver? Right. But the audience, right. because of the way that Michael Stolberg recites the words. It becomes obvious that when he says, does mom know, it means, does mom know that you could have been gay? And that's a different, <laughs> and it's the correct interpretation. It comes from the public, not from me. That you've just that given away the ending yes. to the people who haven't seen the film. What? You've just given away the ending to people who haven't seen no, the film. No, 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 no. Well, doesn't go with well if you haven't seen it, well get out of here. Well worth seeing. Well worth seeing. Thank you. <laughs> How many people have seen it? Raise your hand. There you go. Okay, okay, there we go. Um, have you had discussions about Jewish identity before? I mean, is this something that in the filmmaking process that you connected? Like, you, I you have said, I'm gay Jew. Um, you say, not. Um, is this something that when you discuss the script or developing it? We never developing discussed it. We never, we discussed, it. We never, never. discussed it. And I'll tell you something this. Luca Guadagnino is half Arab and half Italian. That's His right. mother's Moroccan. Hello? And, and you, Luca and I never discussed that thing. He never does. He never, never discusses it. He doesn't talk about it. The Jewish and thing or his own background? His own background, that he's Arab. He's an Arab <laughs> who, who, who directed a movie about a Jew. Uh, uh, OK? And, and, and he did a brilliant job. <coughs> he did. Brilliant. Yeah. There was one moment in which, when I got a call from the, one of the producers, and he said, we know we have these two other actors coming up. And he said, there's Army Hammer. And I said, I think I've seen him in a film. It's the, the one on the Facebook thing. He says, yes. He is partly Jewish. His grandfather was an arm and hammer, his great-grandfather. Yes. And so he said, he said, as if that was OK. And he says, the other one is called Timothy, Timothy Chalamet. Chalamet. Well, so he's a form of shalom, OK? And he, he's, he's Jewish, too. And, and as, as if that made it OK for them to play the parts of Jews. Not only is <laughs> Timothy Jewish, his mother is Jewish. She was an actress in the Yiddish theater, OK? And he was brought up on the Upper West Side, went to LaGuardia High School. Yeah. He's the most Jewish kid you can ever get. You know, he's a New Yorker, a savvy Jewish. So it wasn't Jew. your decision, either of your decision, to say, let's look for Jewish actors. No, it no. Just I would never say such a thing. No, no, no. You know, if you have a perfectly Christian kid playing a Jewish role perfectly, yeah. that's fine that, with me. Th that turned out to be serendipitous. Yeah. But you maybe know. there was a casting director who said, actually, let's try, or no, it no, just happened. No, 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 no. It's just, maybe it's just the way that Hollywood is. No, what happened with Timothy Chalamet is that he was in a play in New York called The Prodigal Son that John Patrick Shanley wrote, actually four years ago from today, I think, right. because it was around Thanksgiving. <coughs> And I went to see this play in the cold of winter with a friend of mine. And this kid, this 17-year-old kid, is like staggering. And we've been looking for an Ilio. And at one point, we were talking um, to Sheila Buff to play the other role. And we didn't have a Timothy yet. We didn't Sheila have a, Buff's an Jewish Ilio. too. 
What? Shia yeah, LaBeouf's Jewish as well. Yes, but that he was playing the other. He was the, he's up playing to the other Army Hamid as well. Yes. The, yeah. So I see this 17 year old kid and I call up my closest friend, Brian Swartstrom, who's an agent, whose husband, Peter Spears, was my partner in the movie, in the, 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 buying it originally. And I say to Brian, and Brian represents every major talent. Tilda Swinton, I mean, a whole bunch of a raft of people. And I say to Brian, oh my God, Brian, we found our Ilio. He said, what's his name? I said, Timothy Chalamet. I signed him yesterday. <laughs> so. uh, are you aware of the, um, there's been a controversy in the UK about a play um, called Falsettos, which was performed in America. Which one? Falsettos. And it has, um, it was, it's written by Jewish people. It's about Jewish people. And in the American version, um, there were Jewish actors. But it, when it came to Britain, um, there were no um, Jewish people I within it or even in the, in the production process. And it's been, by s some artists have criticized this, this idea of cultural appropriation and the idea that non-Jewish actors can lead to more stereotyping and perhaps negative, negative images of Jews on stage. Is that something that you feel is a current debate in, in your lines of work, or you just think actors are actors? I think it's ridiculous. I mean, a, a gay person <laughs> could play a straight person, and a straight person should play a gay person, and a Jew should play a non-Jew, and a non-Jew should play a Jew. But what it's about Scarlett Johansson, also Jewish, um, playing a Japanese It's going anime too far, thing. I think. You think she should be able to play a Japanese person? I think she should be, it was a transgender person that she was supposed to play. And that, she was supposed to pl play in a movie about a transgender. She was gonna play the transgender person, not a Japanese. Which is the, there was a Japanese. <laughs> so who was the, going was to play Jap the Japanese? And the, no, no, the transgender community. Sorry? Ghost in the Shell. Ghost in the Shell, it's Japanese. Which yeah. one, which one? It was Scarlett Johansson playing a Japanese oh, character. Oh really? Ghost in the Shell. I think that's But there's ridiculous. a better example. Supposing you're casting, uh, uh, the entertainment business is different than what I do as a writer. In other words, as a writer, you can create whatever you want. Nobody's looking, you're not appropriating anything. But uh, think of this, you're, you're casting for actors and you're doing a New Testament story of Jesus and Mary. And you're trying to find an actor to play Jesus. S does he have to be Jewish? <laughs> Wait, it's not over. How about the Virgin Mary? Does she have to be a virgin? <laughs> okay, because if you're going to be, because you're appropriate. Yeah, but was she? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no wait, didn't okay. say that. There didn't you have that. it. You went there. I didn't. 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 She it's slept with God. Hypothetical. Hypothetical. Well. Um, yeah, it's a it's a very live debate. It's a very moment. especially very. in the entertainment business where you have not enough people playing certain roles. Then it becomes actually it, it makes or undoes your career. Whereas in the writing business, you know, you can do whatever you want. Nobody polices. It was just a controversy about Cynthia Erivo who was playing Harriet. They said, "Well, why should an English woman play a black slave who's an American?" I think that's the most ridiculous thing ever. Why not? Mm. And she's brilliant, isn't it? So, well, there hello. are a lot of um, black British actors. Hello. Who, who I mean, work it's, in Hollywood. but that's what's going on now in Hollywood. The PC thing in Hollywood now is like way over the top, you know, because of the Me Too and all of that. And I mean, I think it, I personally think it's ridiculous. But I'm in a different generation than the millennials, who have a little more uh, sweat in the game than than I do about that. You, you think it's changing? The, the way well, I think the millennials are carrying that banner, and they're carrying it, I think, just a wee bit too far. Um, Howard, you've been very active um, as, a, as a gay activist through your um, work, as well as your just activism, aside from the documentaries and things you've made. Um, do you see parallels between the Jewish experience and the gay experience, and uh, the ideas of um, identity politics and the well, waves that come uh, through? This is my experience. After the Six Day War was won, um, uh, the New York, there were a whole bunch of Jewish gay leaders in New York, okay, at the time. You know, when I came to New York in 1967, every gay bar had a dance floor and a back room, okay? And men couldn't dance with other men. They had to be in a circle with a woman at the center. It was a mafiosi, a fat mafiosi sitting on a stool, and if two men touched each other, um, they would shine the flashlight on you. 
They shown the flashlight on you three times. They had to deal with the NYPD who came in and arrested these guys. So that's how Stonewall happened, because some guy came over to a drag queen who was very masculine and touched him. The drag queen hit him. And then the cops started hitting the gay people. The gay people hit back. That's how the gay revolution started. And so um, what was the question that you were asking me at the beginning? Do you see parallels oh, between the Jewish yes. experience? So, so what happened was the, the, everything changed after Stonewall. And the gay young Jewish leaders in New York took their cue from the Israelis who won the Six Day War and said, we're not going to stand for this anymore. And they used that as their inspiration. Not a lot of people know this. I knew it because I was part of it. And so the whole gay revolution was based on the Israeli winning of the Six Day War. And so I was at the center of both things. So it formed my whole persona. And you've also made Sparkle, the film, twice, which is all set in the same era. Yes. And um, is about um, black identity politics as well. So well, I, when I was a little boy, I identified not with sports figures, but with black female singers. Uh, Diana Ross, like you know, the Supremes. I loved them. And I was a little boy growing up in uh, Far Rockaway. And all the other little boys, they like rock and roll. But I liked R&B. Because R&B is, is, the, is the language of the oppressed. Okay, Essentially, it's church music. I'll cl ain't no mountain high enough. There is no mountain high enough to get to you, oh God, which later transmogrified in, I'll crawl on shards of glass with you, oh baby, just to get to you, oh fuck me. And that's the essence of what R&B is, essentially. And I identified with that ethos uh, of, the, of the oppressed woman rather than the ethos of rock and roll, which is all about anger. And so very early on, and my father, when he found out that I was gay when I was four, was not too happy. And when I read Andre's book, the reason that I bought the book was because of that scene with the father on the couch. Because he says to the boy, treasure this moment. It's the only time you're ever going to have a first love. I wish I had done it when I had the chance, essentially. And my father was not like that. And so my father bullied me. And that's how I learned how to out-bully a bully. And so I had a whole different point of view about that. And that's what changed me. Thank you. Uh, Andre, you also um, use music a lot in your work. Um, not, not R&B, as far as I've gathered. But how do you feel that that um, music sort of can be communicated in written work and also connects to a wider culture, a European culture, um, and this idea which also Amos Oz talks about, the sort of unrequited love affair of Jewish people with, with European culture, uh, through, through music especially, well, in your work? In my case, it's requited. I cannot pretend that it's not requited. I love Europe. I love European culture. Um, Euro Europe has always been wonderful to me. And, uh, and I revere what Europe has produced, uh, even in the name of Christianity. I mean, uh, there's amazing things. That, and classical music, for me, is the purest form of, of anything. It, I, I think that uh, I always give this example. When you think of the very best that mankind has produced on this planet, it could be a Beethoven quartet. A late quartet by Beethoven. That, that's, that's it. There's nothing better. Uh, it includes the iPhone, the iPad, and whatever the iMac. Okay, the, you just or oh, going to the moon. The Beethoven quartet wins uh, for me. And so whenever I I put in my work a Beethoven quartet or anything by Bach, or um, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say this is not about day to day life. This is not about the here and now. This is not about everything you read about. It's about some other dimension. And the word classical music, the word Beethoven, basically is a, were my way of opening the door to say, OK, now we're going into, go into a particular place that is sacred. Uh, I don't believe in the holy of holies of temples, but I do believe that when you go into a, a chamber music moment, you're entering, you're speaking to God, and God exists. You're, you're there. Uh, and so for me to induct classical music into my work, it's not what 
you might call the soundtrack of my book. That's not it at all. It's that these people are listening to Beethoven, they're listening to Bach, or they're discussing Bach or Haydn. And so what they're doing is saying, hold the world. We're not of this planet right now. We're in this different sphere. And that's my way of doing it. And because I'm not particularly happy with um, the real world as it is. I, I like European culture. I love French culture. I'm not so sure I like France. Okay. And I love or French it. people. Well, I didn't say that, okay? Uh, but it, there's something about the French culture. The French prose is so perfect that um, that's it. That's its domain of itself. Whether you find it in Paris, whether it ever existed in Paris, is a question that I'm not interested in. I like the what's on paper, and I like what I hear. I come from four Hasidic dynasties, <laughs> uh, you know, and the, the essence of Hasidism is they use the, the Kabbalah with the esoteric studies of Judaism. And there's a concept in the Kabbalah that's called devekus, devekut, which means the attaching of yourself to the godhood. All of Judaism is about that, is attaching yourself to the godhood, the transcendence, which is like classical music and R&B. <laughs> but there's a bittersweet, there's a bittersweet <laughs> thing in it, is that that could never be. You could never do that. And so in R&B, for instance, there's a duality. There's the joy of trying to reach the godhood, and then there's the sadness of not being able to do that. And that's a very Hasidic way of transcendent experience, and it's about unrequited love, which has the same concept, okay? You can't get it. You have that thing of going for it, and there's a joy in going for it, but then you can't get it, and there's a sadness. That's my point of view. It's the same thing. I think we, yeah. we, are, we happen to agree on this one. <laughs> <laughs> and on the topic of um, cultures and the relationship between people and cultures and countries and their cultures, um, I'd like to just mention Israel. Um, you, you've mentioned your um, uh, experiences um, in 67 and the familial um, relationship going back, but, but you're not Israeli um, and you, don't, you haven't chosen to live there. And um, Andre is someone who's sort of um, moved, moved national identity, shifted. Um, what's your, I'm interested to know what both of your relationships are with Israel you don't have to say Israelis, but if you, you understand what I'm saying. This idea, the idea of what Israel oh. represents and, and um, the culture it comes from and the relationship between the diaspora, um, where perhaps we have a lot more cultural freedom in relation well, to Israel. Just to go there, um, I think the existence of Israel makes it possible for me to be this kind of enfant terrible of Judaism. In other words, I know that there's a place that has been conquered, that is ours, and that is, exists and has to exist. No question about that. But the fact that Israel exists allows me to feel it's OK for me to dabble with Christianity. It's OK for me to sort of renounce my Judaism. It's OK for me to do all these. Judaism is safe. In other words, there is a place where you can be a Jew and be totally OK being a Jewish. And you can be a strong Jew because that exists. Um, on, uh, the, the, the way I relate to Israel is, is, is amazing because um, I love going there. I've been invited there quite a few times, and I love going. <coughs> They're very nice to me, and I'm very nice to them. And, and basically, but I cannot say that I don't even speak Hebrew. So I speak in English, which is an artificial language to me, in a, to a people who have learned English the way I have in school. And, and we communicate that way, and yet it still works. Um, would I live in Israel? I don't think so. Uh, it's not my country. I don't feel at home, totally at home there. But I like the idea that in Israel I can walk and feel that it's OK to be Jewish. There's not a question that comes to my mind about my Judaism. I love Israel more than anything. It's the single most important thing for me. And um, I mean, I speak fluent Hebrew, and I grew up, you know, Hebrew, 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 is Israel, Israel, Israel. And I was just at Gay Pride, 500,000 people Tel Aviv. in Tel Aviv, okay? And Israel's like America, you know, red state, blue state. Red state, Jerusalem, blue state, uh, Tel Aviv. And when you're in that bubble, it's like you can't believe what you're experiencing because it's so free. And so I, 
love it there. And I identify that way, both as a gay man and as a, as a Jew. And as diaspora Jews, um, what do you think are the biggest issues today facing Jewish communities around the world? Um. It's a big question, but from, from your perspectives, having um, grown up in different areas and practicing in sort of different areas of the arts, but um, coming together and it's having lots in common. There's one thing that exists, and God, I wish it didn't exist, because it defines the life of so many Jews around the world. It's anti-Semitism. Hating Jews is so easy. Um, and eradicating Jews. I was in Barcelona 10 years ago, and I was doing a piece about the disappearance of the Jewish culture in Barcelona in 1492 or 1391. Um, and you know, it works. You can actually make every <coughs> Jew disappear. It almost worked during World War II. It can work. And, and so anti-Semitism for me is the vilest thing on this planet. I think there are three things. I mean, this is how I judge cultures. Um, I judge culture by how they treat women. Most of the world treats women horribly. How they treat gays and how they treat Jews. I think these are the three litmus tests that I have for a culture. And you feel it's usually the same if, if you're back to one, it you're back to the it's, other. It's a, there's a kind of concurrence of the three. I'm not saying they always exist, but uh, I'm, I have experienced anti-Semitism through my whole childhood. And it's a terrible feeling because it does make you who you become. There's no question. It has an effect. You, it's very hard to say, um, I mean, I, I envy you, but I could not fight it. I couldn't fight anti-Semitism. It's way too dangerous. There's too many anti-Semites in a school where you have 400 kids. You know, you can't fight it. Uh, especially when you're small as I was and weak and all those things. And your parents teach you to be scared. Don't tell them you're Jewish. So you, you, you sort of appropriate that idea. But uh, for me, the, to answer your question, it, right now it's anti-Semitism and there's a dose of it in many places. And I, you know what my point of view is. I told it to you a hundred times. Israel has, you know, 200 nuclear bombs. You know, <laughs> don't <laughs> mess with us, you know. Tehran, you know, they throw one missile at Tel Aviv and there will be no Tehran the next day, trust me. Do you, do you also think that this is the biggest issue facing communities, not just in Israel, but... Uh, <coughs> well, I think Israel is the flashpoint of anti-Semitism, which has existed for thousands of years. The only time I've ever felt anti-Semitism was in Hollywood, okay? Because Hollywood, they're all progressive Jews and they all conflate the Netanyahu government with Israel. So they hate anything that has to do with Israel, although they buy Israeli formats. They bought 55 of them. I taught, them how to, I taught the Israelis how to do that um, with uh, Fauda, um, uh, you know, the, yeah, what? In treatment? Yes, in, in treatment, treatment. All, all those Shadow things. One. I taught the Israelis how to do that in a master class that I did for, uh, under the auspice of the uh, Jewish Federation of Los Angeles uh, for seven years. But I, when I try to go around selling a mini-series about the Six-Day War, okay, which I participated in, I had David Ellison, whose father is the third richest Jew in the world, and has, who's given him $500 million to make movies. He finances all the Paramount movies. I had um, Sam Raimi, who directed Spider-Man, I had Todd Ellis Kessler, who wrote The Good Wife, and we went around to 20 companies in LA to try to sell that Michael Oren's book. No one bought it, okay? We had the most prized package <laughs> that you could possibly think of, and no one bought it. But do you think people are scared of the anti-Semitism that might come their way if they start backing I think that's, pa that's part of it. That's part of it, but the anti-Semitism comes from Jews. Okay, because most of the executives that I pitched were Jewish. And so they have the, the thing that you have. Uh, I don't, but they did. And I don't give a fig, okay? <laughs> I'm gonna make my six day war movie come hell or high water, okay, one day. The same thing happened with uh, a movie that I was developing with Steven Spielberg about the uh, War of Independence, okay? I was developing it with him. <coughs> 
the Intifada happened, and Stephen called me and said, let's put a pin in this. Who could be sympathetic to an Israeli pilot today? That should give you the clue about what it's like in Hollywood. Yeah. yeah. But as you said, these um, obviously film didn't exist before, um, but the anti-Semitism has been there for s in different guises for so long yeah, that for 3, Israel's years. perhaps the ex uh, excuse, you know, yes, that they'd I find think it is. other ways to... People yes. would find other ways to express it. Well, the, the, you know, the anti the, the anti semite they use anti-Zionism as a way to express their anti-Semitism. It's not different than Hitler. But in your film career, you, you said you had difficulties sort of recently getting um, these projects backed. But how have you managed to sort of veer your way through politics in, within your, the films that you've made? You know, it's been a tough slog. And because of the stance that I took, um, I was very well known in Hollywood for essentially this right-wing stance about Israeli politics. But because they knew that my family came from seven generations of Israelis and I spent so much time in Israel and I fought in the Six-Day War, people don't mess with me <laughs> because they know how I feel. And so you told they, them enough times that you'll wake up early I, to kill them. Been in the newspapers. I'm famous for this in Hollywood, so they don't mess with me. They, they wouldn't dare. Number one, I know too much, and most of the people in Hollywood are stupid about this. They don't know the history, and I do. And when they argue with me, I massacre them. <laughs> and Andre, in your new book, find me, um, you've got slightly more pronounced Jewish themes, I think. Um, it, th this revisits the characters um, from Call Me By Your Name, which was your first novel. Yes. So you've sort of gone back and revived them. Um, so what drew you back to them, and, and what perhaps encouraged you to, to run Jewish threads through it, it's, and even a, a Holocaust um, thread? There's a Holocaust thread. I mean, those are the obvious ones. like. You know, the fact that there's a German family that has moved to the United States or, or to Italy. And um, these are clear things. But there's a, another Jewish thread which is probably more sub, subliminal in, in many respects. And it's the fact that um, we don't know how to remember or we try to remember. And remembrance is, of course, I think the, the most important thing that a Jew has with him. In other words, you, you have to remember, because if you don't remember, then you're not Jewish. Or at least you have to cultivate the art of remembrance. And there's a moment in the book where the father says that whenever he goes back to Rome, he likes to walk around Rome and basically go to places that have meant something to him. And uh, in other words, it's as if he's trying to reconnect with his youth, his young years as a student in Rome, and so on. And what is important to me is that this is not only about the father, but the father has taught the son to do the same thing. But you use quite a, a Christian term of the vigil for it. Yes. Well, I, di I didn't know what else to call it. it, yeah. it is, these it's, are it's vigils fitting. because if you know Rome, for example, you know that uh, in many old streets in Rome, uh, when you get to a corner, there's like a little Madonna on the, on the wall and there's a candle or a light there. And you're, you're meant to stop there for a moment and just cross yourself or invoke the uh, help or to pray for the dead, whatever it is. But then you walk away. These are called vigils. And, and the father does, who's Jewish, by the way, he performs vigils as he walks around the streets of Rome and tells this new girlfriend that he's got, this is where I did this. And she says, I don't know how to share this with you, but I can take a picture of you in front of it. And, but then you have the son doing the same thing with his father, which I think is so important. It's, it's sort of the opposite of the story of Abraham and Isaac. It's sort of reversed. The father taking the son, and the son taking the father now, and they're walking, and the, the son is going to stop against a wall and say, this is my vigil, and he explains to them what it is that happened <laughs> on that spot. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, is, this is not really the Madonna. It's a, it's a sort of a, it's the craft of memory of, of trying to, and I'm going to use another Christian term, you're trying to resurrect the person you were 
few years before, 10, 40 years before, and you're trying to uh, re-identify with yourself then. And I think that this is what we do as Jews. It's uh, what is that famous word, the zahor? The core. The, yeah, the, the basically, it's remembrance is sacred. It's not just I'm looking into my past. This it's also taking a model from another religion, usually Christianity, and well, making it our own, like presence at Hanukkah, whatever it is, and take yeah. something which exists in culture and you, you take make it, it personal or, or yeah. fam but, familiar. But the essence of Judaism is about memory and remembrance. Yes. The Haggadah, the whole Seder is all about remembering the liberation from Egypt and coming. You end out of Egypt on a Seder yeah. night, which is I, I ended really on, the, on the night of the Seder. And in fact, there's, but there's an, a nice moment there because, and it will sort of dilapidate everything I'm saying right now, it's that at <laughs> on this very night of the Seder, the boy walks out by himself and, and basically goes to the beach, looking at the beach, which is celebrating Ramadan. So you have these people walking with lanterns all over, and he's looking at the beach and he's saying, okay, over there, right in front of Egypt is Greece. This is the land of Solon and Pericles. He loves Greece. And this is over there is Rome, and over there is Spain, and beyond Spain is France, the language that I speak. But he never turns his eyes to Palestine or Israel because somehow nobody in my family has ever basically emigrated to Israel. So this was kind of, re you, no, you don't want to go to Israel. That's not what you do. We go to Europe, mm -hmm. where, of course, there was just a Holocaust 20 years earlier. Uh, but, but similarly, Israel, 1948, was problematic for your community because of the consequences. Oh, the consequences were, they were drastic. In other words, but we, I mean, look at, talking about remembrance, I come from a family of Jews from Turkey who emigrated, not to the United States, but to Egypt. Think of how stupid you've got to be, <laughs> okay? You've, you've spent 5,000, 3,000, 2,000 years sort of playing with the memory of slavery in Egypt. You finally are released from Egypt. And what do you do in my family? You go back to Egypt. That is a basic, the, 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 the utter in stupidity, okay? But we've done that. And uh, now we lament Egypt the way so many of the Jews on their way to Israel, so as they're crossing the Sinai for 40 years, they lament the fact that they don't have garlic. Let's go back to Egypt and have garlic, okay? And this is what my family was doing. So we repeat the same, not only we repeat our fate, but we repeat the same mistakes. But it, well, I had the exact opposite experience because <laughs> seven generations before, my grandfather's great-grandfather came to Palestine in 1840 when he was 40 and had eight children. My grandfather's grandfather started the first matzah factory and the first talus factory in the old city and then in Me'ah Sharim. So they I have- They went for religious reasons. Yeah, As yeah, to live in the Holy Land. The, the, you know, that's the commandment. It's one of the mitzvot, one of the commandments. And so, that's just on my father's side. On my father's mother's side, they came from Poland in 1892. They were religious Zionists, Chovevei Tzion. And they moved to the north of Israel where the Rothschilds gave them an acre and a mule and some agricultural implements. And they started essentially what was a kibbutz. <coughs> um, and it didn't work out. And they moved to Tzfat and they moved to Jerusalem. So my roots are so deep into Israel, into going to Jerusalem and going to Israel. That's the way I think, and that's the way I was brought up. Also, talking about memory, you're sitting next, I'm sitting next to a Proust scholar, okay? Proust was half Jewish, so. And he wrote about remembrance. The Madeleine is all about dipping the Madeleine <laughs> into the tea and remembering, and then he tells that story which is one of the greatest stories ever written in French literature. So there are cross connections and cross pollination between those two cultures. And the theories of cultural memory that have sort of ripe in academia are all post come out of post Holocaust yes. um, theorists, um, many of whom are American, because where else did people end up? Um, I'd love to take some questions from the floor. We have some microphones, um, if they could sort of make their way down. Um, we'll take a couple. Yeah, th um, there's sort of, a, yeah, let's do one, two, three. Or let's start with two and see how we go. Yeah. Um, Amos yeah. Oz from Israel, uh, Paul Auster, New York, and Saul Bellow from Chicago. 
please tell me your favorite and why. What, what is the question? <laughs> Paul Auster. Amos Oz and Amos Saul Bellow. Saul Bellow. Who are your favorite and why? If They're not my favorites. I don't <laughs> like either of them. I hate Paul Auster and I don't like Amos Oz, really. Um, I don't like them. Um, why I did you pick those authors? Well, I worked with, I worked with, I worked with Paul Auster uh, on a movie with Hugh Hudson, an Englishman. Um, I made a movie called Lost Angels with Hugh Hudson. And he had Paul Auster write a, a screenplay, and he was a horrible person. <laughs> what can I say? His talent may be great, but I don't get it. That's not my thing. Andre? No, I'd love to answer another question. <laughs> well, if, you want, uh, if we want to hear you um, hopefully speak um, positively about um, <coughs> great, <laughs> great American Jews, do you want to tell us about Leonard Bernstein? Stein? Oh. Okay. Go on. Okay, now we have time. <laughs> Quick little anecdote. So I, uh, as I told you, I volunteered for the Six Day War, and 30 days after the war, Leonard Bernstein came to conduct Mahler's Resurrection Symphony, number two, on the newly reconquered Mount Scopus, Harat Sophim, and he came to visit the volunteers, most of whom, by the way, were Scandinavian. And I'm in the Hadassah Hospital now, standing with my wife, with the stethoscope hanging out of my pocket and blood-stained white shoes. And Lenny, the maestro, looks at me and says, oh my God, you look just like this guy that I know who's my waiter at a discotheque in New York. And I answered him in Hebrew, maestro, I was your waiter. <laughs> Whereupon he kissed me on the lips and gave me four tickets to the concert. My parents had flown in from America, ready to pay $1,000 a ticket in 1967, it was a benefit, and they couldn't get tickets. And I marched to the King David Hotel with four tickets. Where'd you get those tickets, my mother said. I said, Leonard Bernstein. My mother no, was no idiot. I took her to the concert. At the party afterwards, Lenny asked me if I wanted to be a gopher on this documentary that they were making about him conducting the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra in Judea and Samaria for the IDF. And you couldn't get in there. It was a war zone. And I wanted to see Bethlehem. And I wanted to see Hebron. And I wanted to see Jericho. And so I became his gopher. And then one night I walked into his tent and came out on the other side. Mm -hmm. And you can understand that. <laughs> and um, so I became very close to the maestro. And he was, he, he, he was married with three children, by the way. And he says to me, you should leave medical school and go into the arts. You're a great storyteller. You'll never bow to the mistress of science, he said to me. I didn't know what he was talking about. But then he took me on vacation with his wife and three children to Italy, <laughs> which was a sophisticated situation from a boy from Far Rockaway. <laughs> uh, and um, when I went back to medical school in the fall of 67 at Hahnemann in Philadelphia, I'm in the middle of an amputation that I was assisting on, and I'm listening le to Lenny saying to me, you'll never bow to the mistress of science. So I call up. Did you the finish the amputation? <laughs> <laughs> so I call up the maestro. So I go to New York. I say to the maestro, I left medical school, I took your advice. He said, well, I'm married with three children, but I'll introduce you to three of my best friends. So he introduced me to Catherine Hepburn, and I became her assistant on a musical that she was doing called Coco, about Coco Chanel. And then he introduced me to Stephen Sondheim. I didn't waste a minute there. And then he introduced me to Kay Thompson, who wrote Eloise at the Plaza. So Lenny and Stephen set the bar very, very high for me in terms of genius. And it's so- It's amazing who you bump into in Israel. <laughs> <laughs> we all have it. Like, oh, what are you doing here? Well, that um, summer in 67 was the greatest summer uh, I ever spent. <laughs> um, there was a question um, along, along here. Uh, yeah, thank you. Just out of topic, um, could you both describe your early careers, uh, your early career artists, and what that looked like for you guys? Early career? As in that, that weird beginning bit where you're beginning. How old do uh, I have to be? I would say from, tell us about your lives between the ages of 18 and 35. I think maybe, you, you know, we were talking before about studies and how so often that sort of gets interrupted and, and sort of having foot in more than one door. I mean, you might, you, you obviously had to choose between medicine and the arts and, and you I, I was writing and teaching. So I was always writing and... Uh, <coughs> But I never published. I published the first piece, at the first time I really published, because I, I published a few things as, as a kid, 
But um, I think I was probably 37 or 38 when I first published my first piece, so relatively late in one's career. But I did stop after <coughs> that. Um, but I, I was a graduate student forever. And has anybody been a, you've been a graduate student, but has anybody forever. been a graduate <laughs> student here? Uh, yes, you know, it's the, one of the most horrible parts of one's life. Uh, because you're not as popular as the undergraduates, <laughs> and you get treated very badly by the professors. And they don't want to direct your thesis, but they really need to, because otherwise they don't have a job. Um, <coughs> so you go from being, and I just hated graduate school so much, that some, at some point I just quit. So I, w I went and worked for various Wall Street firms, and then I didn't like that either after four years. And I went into advertising. And that lasted a year. And then they fired me, <coughs> which was the best thing they did. And then I decided, OK, I've got to finish my dissertation, which I finished, wrote and finished in about seven months, very intensely. And it was done. And I got my PhD. And uh, then I got a job as a assistant professor at Princeton. And uh, as I was teaching, and I'll stop there, as I was teaching, I decided I don't want to do academic work. I want to write, you know, fiction. So I wrote something that is like fiction, uh, called a memoir. Uh, and uh, I wrote a memoir, and uh, you know, in about a year and a half, it took me to write the whole book. I took a semester off, and uh, and I wrote that book, and it did very well. It established me, my career, which is why Princeton did not give me tenure. But then other colleges did, and I went there, and eventually. Um, I became, I just, I took the last job I took, which was about 20 years ago, I said, I'm not going to write a piece of scholarship unless I choose to. I want to do fiction and I want to write essays. And they said, okay, that's a condition, that's fine, we'll accept it. And they did. And ever since then, I've had the best job in my life. I know that there are several early, what we call early career um, artists here tonight. So if you've got any sort of words of advice to add to your personal stories, that would be... Oh, I, I have wor words of advice for my <laughs> career. Um, Get up early. How far <laughs> back do you want to go? Because when I was nine years old, I'm 74, when I was nine years old in Far Rockaway in 1954, there was a re-release of Gone with the Wind. And I, my mother, Palestinian immigrant, took me to the movies to see Gone with the Wind. And it blew my mind to smithereens. And I said to my mother, Ima, mother, who made that movie? And she said, Clark Gable and Vivian Lee. And I said, who hired Clark Gable and Vivian Lee? <laughs> and she went to the library, and she found this book called Memo, which are the memos of David Selznick about Gone with the Wind. And I said to myself, then, self, this is what you're going to do. But I got waylaid <laughs> because of the Vietnam War. I didn't want to be drafted, and so I went to medical school. And so then after I stopped, uh, after I left medical school, when I look back at my career, it looks golden. But actually doing it was a nightmare because the business is about 99.9999999999% rejection. You have to be... You have to get up on that horse after you're thrown down and keep on getting on and keep on getting on and keep on getting on. And you move forward until finally you make it. And that's been my history with every one of my movies. And, and would you like to offer some advice to people the who advice are sort of is in that middle stage? I think the advice is taught to me by one of my sons. Um, he's very smart. He had the job at Time magazine where you know, he could have done very well because he's a very good writer. And he decided not to do that. And he never wanted to take a job because he said, it's going to get in the way of my writing. Hmm. And so what he did, which is something I didn't do, which he's decided to invest in what he wants to do. End of story. A invest wholeheartedly, 100%. In what you want to do, don't make. I made so many compromises. I went into business. I went to Wall Street. I went into advertising. I shouldn't have done that. That was a waste of time. When I think back, of course, it helped me. It gave me a lot of education. I made fantastic friends, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But finally, I should have stuck to what I wanted to do. I would have been published by the age of twenty-eight. You never know. No, but you know what? There are no regrets when it comes to that. No regrets whatsoever. Thank you. Um, yeah, we've got lots of sort of questions going up the, the midline. Yeah. 
So if we could have the mic, one microphone here and one going up the up the middle. Thank you. Who's got it first? Uh, yep. Let's, let's take. Should we take two questions? So this one and then at the front. Yep. The person with the mic. Um, when will Elio and Oliver get reunited? <laughs> have you read the book? Yeah. No, the new book. What's new a, one. Find me. When will Elio and Oliver get reunited? Well, if you buy the book after this and you read it quite quickly, you'll find out. Right? Well, if you read, read it slowly, you'll find out Just skip the whole slower. thing. Go to the last chapter. Go to the last chapter. <laughs> Is it going to be on film as well? In the cinema? I have not heard a word from anybody. About what? About the movie. Of the next find movie. Me. It's a complicated situation. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a question here at the front. Uh, yep. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to um, follow up on a question which was asked about what do you think um, the main threat to Jewish people is, and you both say essentially anti-Semitism and how you've combated it. I'm not Jewish, but I really do want to help in combating this heinous kind of behavior. I'm ashamed it's even happening in this country. Um, I am disabled, so I've actually felt um, a real connection to a lot of what you guys are saying. Um, I often feel you're being told you have to write about being blind because you're blind, can't do anything else. I've not wanted to be disabled. I've not wanted to have a hearing problem, but I'm stuck with it. Um, but I have learned to bear with this. I'm currently writing a piece for my local party, which we are going to use as our charter, which is a commentary on Israel, and I'm watering down as many criticisms of as I can. I'm going to make it as positive as I can. What else can I do to help you guys, to help Jewish people here tonight? Thank you. What else can we do? Yeah. Can we can we help? reach out to other communities um, among as well as the Jewish community? Well, are you using the press? Oh. Yeah, using the press to... Uh, yes. to here, sorry. Yeah. No. Uh, are you using the press? Uh, I'm a journalist by <laughs> training. I'm struggling to get a job because editors don't want people who are blind working for them, but I am trying. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, you keep on writing, as especially as a non-Jew and a disabled person, you would have a lot of credibility. That's right. In the world of di disabled persons, and the world of disabled persons is gigantic. You know, it's huge. So if you keep on writing about it and just keep on pushing about it, coming from your point of view as a non-Jew and as a disabled person, you have so much credibility, people will be sympathetic, I think. I do too. I agree entirely. Uh, it's basically, it's, the press is the best vehicle we have to uh, spread the word um, because you know going on the street may help, but it's the press that ultimately wins. And and you feel the same whether it's um, print or broadcast or um, well broadcast internet. Is, no, I, w I don't know about internet because I don't I use it but not that well. Um, but I think that television is usually very powerful very powerful and uh, the press is also <coughs> powerful and uh, you just have to keep at it and be louder and louder and louder and there's another way uh, right now podcasts are so popular if you develop a following and you can do a podcast about this with that point of view constantly that would be incredible i thank think you. thank you um yep several questions sort of um where, where are the microphones? We have one, if we take a question here, and then at the second row, and then after that we'll go to the back. So let's have two questions in a row. Yes, this microphone that goes below you. Um, I hear what you said about the press and the podcast, but in a nutshell, or maybe in two nutshells, what do you say? Okay, thank you. What do you say? And yeah, th let's take the next question. Um, I was wondering if there's any similarity between you and Samuel in the book. Uh, no. Uh, no, I think we have the same beliefs uh, and the same maybe personality, but we don't have the same experiences, no. And do you feel like him? Do I feel like him? Not really, no. No, uh, no. Like I mean, I can identify with him, if that's what oh. you're asking. Yes. Uh, I can identify with all my characters, but I'm not them. 
by any means, no. I'm quite different. Well, here's a straight man who wrote about two gay men that fall in love. Hello. <laughs> I mean, and wrote about it brilliantly. And it became the most popular movie in the history of gay movies. And there have been 40,000 gay movies made since the start of movies. And Call Me By Your Name is the cherry on the top of the cake, written by a straight man. Hello. <laughs> And the first question was, what, what message, I suppose, if, if um, activists who want to decrease, defeat anti-Semitism are able to reach out to the media, what is the message? What, what do we want people to say? Well, it, it, I think it's, it's uh, I don't know what they're going to say, but they have to condemn it. And they have to condemn it from both the personal point of view, which is this particular biography <coughs> there, but at the same time, it's reaching out to to, to the question of anti-Semitism. And it makes perfect sense because after all, people who are, have whatever kind of disability, and my mother was completely deaf, don't forget, and she was made fun of in the streets all the time uh, because she was deaf and she spoke in a funny way. And, um, and she didn't care, she didn't care. She was a tough cookie, by the way. Um, but basically, coming from them, in other words, the point of origin is very important. Uh, here's who I am and this is what I believe. And this is what I've heard recently has happened. You, you're basically uh, in a journalistic mood. You take whatever issue has bothered you, particularly if it bears on anti-Semitism, and you readdress it from that particular point of view. It's basically, you're not repeating yourself, but you're using your current situation as a launching pad to attack anti-Semitism. The, the only thing you can do with anti-Semitism is attack it. You know, in America, there's a, a man named Brett Stevens, the journalist, yes. and he writes for the New York Times, and he's always writing about the moral point of view of Israel and how just the, the, the existence of Israel is, and, what, and he's, he's pro-Israel. But as a journalist, you have to take that... Um, uh, you're on that slippery edge, and if you can delineate the government of Israel separated from the Jewish people, then that's a very important thing to do. Also, yeah. in both of your works, you've been very successful, in, and you obviously have the skill of taking a story or a message and making it universal. The, 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 the Call Me By Your Name has reached so many people who are not Jewish or gay or Italian or whatever it's, or, or male. And, and in your films as well, I mean, th th things like Father of the Bride or Buffy the Vampire State, these are stories which millions of people tap into even though they're not vampires, uh, or vampire well, slayers. Well, so Buffy the Vampire Slayer is about wi empowerment of women. And when I read that script in 1987, it was rejected by every single studio and financial company in Hollywood. But it's also oh. about a t having a good teacher and how important that's a very Jewish lesson. And what? Having a good teacher is a very Jewish lesson. Oh, very good yeah. lesson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. <laughs> and that's what Buffy the Vampire Slayer had. Yeah. And um, I finally got it done because I was obsessed and crazed. And it's now become a $2 billion industry, you know, um, because of that, because people can relate to it. Yeah. Yeah, there was about four or five questions just in the chat section. Yeah, should we have three there? And then after we've heard three, we'll pause that there. I think that might be all. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I just want to bring the conversation back to about making um, work, um, art and culture, which engages with Jewish heritage and, and Jewish tradition. Um, you describe the Call Me By My, call me by my Name uh, as this... Um, as delicate as I thought it was very beautiful about the book and the film that the Jewishness is very delicately there but very very present and I want to ask you about this walking that very delicate line because often when engaging with Jewish subjects which are so, there's so much baggage and it can be so heavy-handed how you do, how how can you how you do that how you walk that line and could make sure that it stays that it's present but it's delicate it's not like when sometimes when the Holocaust and themes are threads are there, it can open up just a black hole. So I just want to ask you about that that delicacy and, and the importance of that in the work. Thank you. Just well, have another, can we just oh, have another yes, question yes, while the sure. microphone's up there? There was yeah, just behind. Thank you. Are we answering that question? 
Um, I had a question for uh, Andre Siman. Um, what is your relationship now with uh, Egypt, despite your experiences? Do you have some sort of personal attachment, or have you ever gone back to Egypt to, to see it? How has it been uh, for you? Thank you. Okay, so there's two questions. Hopefully, I mean, both of you are welcome to answer them. How do you deal with um, Jewishness in art as delicately as you do and as you can? And Andre, you maybe you want to start with the question about Egypt. That's, that's your history. Uh, maybe I could do the Egypt one. Uh, I, I went back to Egypt in 1995. I went back to Egypt because the New York Times sent me there to write a piece about the man who wrote out of Egypt is now back in Egypt and is writing about his experience <coughs> of rediscovering his hometown 30 years later. And uh, I went there um, expecting to be, um, to, to encounter memories uh, or to encounter the, the, the glow of memory. In fact, I recognized everything right away. I, I never got lost in the city, not once. I took you know, the, the means to travel in the city quite easily. I spoke Arabic. Um, and uh, basically, the one thing that shocked me was that all the street names had been more or less changed so that the remnants of European culture in Egypt had more or less disappeared. There were no Europeans left. Uh, from when I was growing up, Basically, even the, the poorest uh, Egyptian would speak some French. People managed French somehow, and nobody knew French. And so uh, I, I had to speak Arabic, which is fine. Um, eventually, I got into a cab, and I told him, you know, could you take me to such and such a place? Um, and I spoke in Arabic, and he said, oh, my God, you speak Arabic. And I said, yeah. I said, how do you know Arabic? I said, I'm born here. And he said, well, why did you leave? I said, are you kidding me? Uh, <laughs> I said, you don't know? He says, no. I said, uh, and of course, at that point, having lived in New York for 30 years, I told him, because I'm Jewish. And he said, we, he didn't even know if there were Jews in Egypt or had been Jews. There were 80,000 Jews living in Egypt that's one, at one point. Didn't even leave a trace. That's what I meant by you can extinguish an entire ethnic group. Um, now, basically, I've, I've made quite an amazing few friends from Egypt. Um, but they're all like me. They're all, they're all Egyptians. They're all Muslims. But they all feel that they are not quite at home in Egypt. They feel that they belong maybe elsewhere. Not necessarily elsewhere, but maybe elsewhere. And uh, finally, they want me back in Egypt. I got a call from the Egyptian ambassador in the United States saying, we're rebuilding the temples, and we want our Jews back. And of course, I said, first of all, temples don't interest me. <laughs> I'm not religious. And second of all, I said, if you want me back, uh, could you give me my money back? Uh, which is now in, in sort of, it, it's a lot of money. So essentially, uh, I, I've, I feel as if I've been robbed. And, um, and money is an extremely important thing. Uh, yes, I'm Jewish, OK? Uh, <laughs> but uh, basically, when they take your sofa away from you, or they steal a painting from your living room, they've done profound damage to you. And unless that is so, sort of, you, you can forgive it, as I have, but you can't quite forget. And so it's not really forgiveness that I practice. Um, I'm in a state of, I, my book is finally being translated into Arabic in Egypt, in Cairo. And uh, I gave the, the translator, the publishing company, an amazing deal, basically have it for free as long as I can come back to Egypt and see what my book is, how my book is being received in Egypt. That, that's my answer to you. I, I don't know if it makes you happy or not, but there it is. It's honest. I don't, I don't have to answer that Egypt question because I don't, I've never been there. But I can answer the question about how do you deal with Jewishness and gayness in film. Is it in a delicate way, but not in a heavy-handed Well, I'm, like, I'm different than Andre. Andre is um, intellectual, academic, brilliant, and much more delicate than I am. I'm like a sledgehammer. <laughs> and so I made a movie called Stranger Among Us, exploring the, uh, the, Jew the Jewish Hasidic world um, that Sidney Lumet, the great director, directed. So me, it's like I'm frontal right on. The gay thing, what was interesting, 
I'll tell you a story about the movie. In the book, if you've read it, you all know about the peach scene. So That's nothing compared to the rest. So the peach scene, you know, in the book, the um, Army Hammer character eats the peach after he ejaculates into it. In the movie, we had a real talk about that. What should we do? And in the movie, he doesn't eat the peach. You know, Luca just took the camera and went away. So he dealt with it in a delicate way in order not to offend the gay people that wanted to see Army eat the peach, essentially. It was done beautifully and poetically and very non-intrusive, and it was brilliant from my point of view. It is brilliant. Yeah. It was totally brilliant. I, I think that the word delicate is, is it, it might be a bit too fussy as a word. So the other word that I would like to use, and though I don't think, I don't mean, it's very, it's a very chastened movie. In other words, it, it is very, um, it's never frontal. It's always oblique when it comes to certain things. You don't see them sleeping together, but you see them playing footsies with e each other in a very suggestive manner. And this is the, the, the mood of the book. And I think of my write. My writing is far more graphic. I was extremely graphic when it came to gay sex. But how do you deal with Jewish um, yes, themes in the sort of footsie kind of tone? Well, because that's my personality, basically. I, I, I'm never, except for the graphic sex, which I enjoyed writing. Uh, there's no question. Um, but it's, it was more like my, my my take on everything is to be as, as uh, not aloof, but s as I say, oblique. Sort of look at it from a different angle. Normally, even when I describe the sex act as uh, fussily as I do, uh, it's usually after the fact, when they recall three pages, pages after having had sex, what it is that was done. Uh, so th there's always a kind of distancing effect. And I do the same thing with Judaism. Uh, in other words, it's never discussed openly, either in the book or in, in the film, but it's, it's there and it's suggested. And I always work with suggestion much better than I do with sort of the obvious, uh, never again, that sort I, of thing. I've only dealt with the Jewish theme in Stranger Among Us and trying to get my Israeli uh, uh, Six Day War and uh, Independence War off the ground. But in the gay movies that I've made, I've made a lot of them. I've made a lot of documentaries uh, about gay issues, uh, common threads about the AIDS quilt, where we follow six people from the time they get infected till the time they end up on the quilt, and then Celluloid Closet about the history of gay and lesbian images in film. And that really describes the whole history of how gayness is dealt with. I'm now about trying to make a documentary. In fact, some, it was my Susanna Price is here who wants to do it, um, the sequel uh, to uh, Cellular Closet. And then I made paragraph 175 about gays in the Holocaust. Um, and all of those you know, common threads won an Oscar and Cellular Closet was nominated for an Oscar. But they deal with those subjects delicately, I, must, I, I might add, or, and, and ironically. You. Unfortunately, we're really running out of time. I think we have one time for one more burning question, if there is one. There were a few hands at the back. Have they, have they been answered already? Um, OK, the, the, there's one right next to the microphone. We're going to have to take this as our last one, unfortunately. I'm sorry. I would, I'd love to have time for everyone. I just want to know um, your biggest regret. Professionally? What? <laughs> your biggest regret. My biggest regret was that I didn't go to medical school. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, I have so many regrets. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. Um, I can't tell you about my biggest regret because it's personal. But um, I just move on. I, I try not to think about them. If I thought about them, it would have mobilized me because I have so many regrets. And so, you must be Jewish, aren't you? Yeah, that's very <laughs> Jewish. So in order to get out of bed in the morning, I can't think that way. So I have to gird myself for war every morning. Oh, my biggest regret. Um, I, I like to make the distinction between regrets and remorse, and I think they're in one of my books. Uh, remorse is when you feel terrible about something you did. Regret is when you feel terrible about something you could have done and didn't do. And I think that spells almost every day of my life. Yeah. 
And the biggest one, I too cannot tell you about because it's personal. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, um, I'd like to thank Andre Asman and Howard Russellman so very much for being here. Thank you, thank you. Now we know. <laughs> They, they may be um, going off with their regrets as top secret, um, but um, Andre will be in the foyer on the ground floor um, by uh, signing books which you can buy there. And we really hope that you will continue this conversation and um, amongst yourselves and it's been thought-provoking for you. I'd like to thank JW3 for hosting. And um, part, part, it's part of the Global Jewish Conversation Series. And Raymond and Neil. Raymond, Raymond Simonson Raymond and, Simonson Neil Marcus. and Neil Marcus. And obviously the support of the Genesis Philanthropy Group. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you.